Hi, my name is Dan Lasota, and with this short video, I hope to win your support for my proposal to speak at South by Southwest EDU next spring in Austin. Um, why the Faraday effect? I wanted to, uh, well, it's part of my master's project. That's the, that's the short answer. But why I selected the Faraday effect uh, to develop an RCL uh, has a couple reasons. One, in 1845, when Michael Faraday dif discovered the relationship between light, electricity, and magnetism, it was a big deal. It's still a big deal. Uh, astronomers are still using the Faraday effect to measure the magnetic strength, magnetic field strength of uh, very stars very far away. Uh, food scientists are using it to authenticate the quality of olive oils. Um, it's used in telecommunications and all sorts of things. Pedagogically, it's nice because it's a very simple effect. If you um, allow me to just demonstrate what the Faraday effect is now in equation form, if you shine, and, and there's the illustration, if you shine light through a magnetic field, it's going to bend. So the angle that it bends is proportional to the length it travels in meters times the field strength measured in Tesla. And the angle is going to be in radians. That leaves V, the proportionality constant, uh, it's called the Verde constant. That leaves this measured in what I think is probably the coolest units in physics today, radians per Tesla meter. So this is quite simple. If someone doubles the strength of the magnetic field that the light is passing through, the polarization angle will increase by a factor of two. If the material uh, doesn't have it's not a very strong rotator at all, uh, like air, there's not, it's going to be zero, and so there's not going to be any rotation angle at all. Uh, something that's much, a much stronger angle, um, that, will, that will have a more of a visible effect. And uh, we really owe it to the tenacity of um, Michael Faraday. When he first discovered this effect, Back in 1845, he went through many, many materials, and it wasn't until he used something very similar to this. This is leaded glass, um, and back then it was called flint glass. Until he used that object, he, he went through hundreds and hundreds of materials testing and trying to measure angles. He finally found it, and that's, that's how we have, that's why it's named the Faraday effect. Um, so we have the importance of this particular experiment in science. We also have the simplicity of it, and that's good for teaching basic physics, both in the secondary and at the university level. Uh, and I was also seeking a simple experiment so that I could basically get it going and demonstrate not only the science, the technical aspects, but also what I really wanted to focus on was that the best practices in designing a science lab. Uh, it brings us to the whole question of can you do science labs in a remote setting and there's some that say no to be authentic you have to have hands on you have to you have to hold your solenoid in your hands you have to feel how warm it is um, you have to be able to turn the polarizing angle to a certain degree or else you're not you have to measure uh, and interpolate between the graduations on the filter and see where the angle is um, th those are all really important things uh, but there's really good ways to do that. Today we have these things have called web cameras. We in, instead, a real one good example is instead of just giving them a numerical value for either the brightness of the laser or what the angle is, we show them. And so the student still has to interpolate between the lines. It's at 278 degrees or 200 and whatever. They have to figure it out on their own, just as if they were there in the laboratory. Um, and with something as simple as little bits, both to measure the intensity of the laser and also to get the information to a server so that it can be out on the web for students, we can essentially take all the important parts of the experiment and give a mechanism for the student to manipulate it directly through server hardware controls 
we can let the student do the science. So that's what my master's project was, and I'd like to bring that to South by Southwest EDU to share with others uh, the lessons that I learned in my, my project, and this just a very simple thing, but also the research I conducted and looking at the work of others who really kind of over a series of years and their efforts in putting out RCLs, I wanted to show what uh, the best practices are so that you can create your own RCLs and we can get more science to more students. Um, that's really it. That's simple. And uh, I'm hoping to see you next spring. Thanks.